Good morning, Capital. Good morning, Capital. Yeah, it's still morning. Good morning. I am happy to be here. I'm excited to be here. Um, matter of fact, Pastor Rick used some words earlier. He said, we're going to just let him loose. You know, that's the way, visually, that's the way I felt. I felt like I've been in a gate, like a horse getting ready to run the Kentucky Dable, the Derby. You pull me up into the stall and then you leave me there, Pastor Gordon, for almost a year, a little over a year. He first reached out to me over a year ago and I got excited about coming and then the pandemic hit. And then it's just, it's just on my heart. It's on my heart. And this is a special place to me. Matter of fact, I'm going to use a different word. This is a special house to me. When I come to this house, led by the man of God of this house, I've experienced some amazing things. When I've come to Capitol Christian Center, my spiritual father and mother are in the house this morning. They're in this house, the physical building. And I'm so glad they're here. But he invited me to a Man Up conference a few years ago. This church is so uh, special to me. This house is so special to me. I thought I actually had supernatural powers that day. Uh, if some of you were at that Man Up conference, I actually thought I could walk on water. I mean, walk on air. And I actually came off the edge of this stage thinking that I could just walk right on off this thing. And I hit the ground. Boy, it was an experience. So I'm going to be careful today. Because I think this, this place gives me power. And I think I can do things that maybe I can't do or can do. Um, so I'm glad to be here today. I spoke this morning and I, I just, you know, really felt good about being in, in this house. I don't know if half the stuff I'm going to say this time is going to be close to that. But I'm going to just, because I see families out here. I'm looking out and I see so many families and that's so powerful and it's, it's just ministering to me. The word that I gave Pastor Rick this morning that I'd love for you all to grab a hold to is mobilization. That's what I see that's getting ready to happen with this congregation. Pastor Rick didn't share anything with me, not a thing with me. But as he began to talk about connect groups and opportunities to serve, I would love to invite you all as you listen to this message this morning to think about what God wants you to do in this house. Think about what place God has for you to serve in this house. And there are benefits. I'll talk about those later. There are benefits in the house. I hope all of you that are sitting out there right now, you live in homes or wherever you live, there are benefits for the people you take care of in that house. Well, it's no different in the spiritual house. There are benefits when you are in the house and you serve the man and woman of God in the house. I'll talk about that in a moment. So I'm going to ask that you all just consider mobilizing and coming together. The other words, Pastor Rick, that as I was just sitting there and you were talking about the value of connecting is to challenge you to connect now for what's next. Whew, let me say that because some of y'all didn't even catch that. That was too deep for you. I'm going to say it one more time. Connect now for what's next because something's getting ready to happen in this community, in our country, and God's going to need people like us, Christians like us, to do the work. And so I want to invite you to consider that as you listen to this message. For those of you who have your Bibles, I will be reading from to my first page. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. I'll start there, and I'll go all the way through chapter 12, verse 9. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Let me just pause for a moment. They set out to go one place and stopped before they got there. I'll talk about that some more in a minute. Verse 32 says, Terah lives 205 years and he died in Haran. He died 
in a place that he has set out to go to a different place. Verse 12, in, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will, cur I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was, Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all of their possessions that they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired while they were in Haran. And they set out of the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as, as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, this, this, this life, this walk of Christianity, as Jimmy was saying, is battles and blessings. It's battles and blessings. Not just blessings, it's battles and blessings. Sometimes you got to fight for where you're supposed to be and where you're going. I'm going to stop there. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to, his, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then, Ab then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. I'd like to speak on a topic. I had numerous topics, but I want to speak on faith in action. Faith in action. When I think of faith and just walking this Christian life, there are many times when I felt I should do something, but there's also a lot of times that I didn't act on that particular word. And maybe like some of you, I, I don't raise your hands. I'll raise my hand for you. How many of you made a New Year's resolution at the beginning of the year, a few weeks ago? And you said what you were going to do. You were going to do this or do that or lose weight and exercise more. And two, three weeks later, you're already not doing what you had said you were going to do. Because there was no action to back up your, I'm going to change the word, your beliefs. Because faith without action is just a belief. And beliefs alone can change. Beliefs alone can't carry you to what you actually need to accomplish, but there needs to be action along with that faith. So as I look at my first point that I want to share with you all, is that do you believe what God said? Do you believe what God said? In verse 12, 1 through 3, he, God told Abram, he said, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country your people, your father's household to a land that I will show you. Now, I got two questions for y'all. Got two questions for y'all. How has God spoken to you all in the past? Think for a moment as I do leadership training and training to companies and schools and police departments around the country. Um, I teach various content from situational leadership to conversational capacity, building trust, all kinds of stuff. I often ask this question. When you, who do you trust the most? Think of a person that you trust the most. Do that for me. Think of a person that you trust the most. If they were to ask you to do something, tell you where maybe you should even go. Do you trust them enough or do you have a strong enough relationship that you actually do what they asked you to do? And I'm going to ask you another question. Why do you do it? Do you do it because of the relationship you have with them? Do you do it because you trust them? Well, Abram heard from the Lord, and he asked them to go to a place that he will show them. In my life, there's been two things that have been going on. God has kind of approached me in two different ways when he's asked me to do certain things. One way is this way. God will say, Greg, and how God speaks to me, he'll say, Greg, 
I want you to go here. And I say, well, where are we going, Lord? He says, I'll tell you when we get there. Just, just go. Just go do it. My spiritual father's in the house. And uh, at one point, he, he said this to me. I was a federal agent here in, in the Oakland area, the Bay Area. It was my first assignment being in the Bay Area. Working full-time, actually, we were required to work 40 hours, no, 50 hours a week. And he came to me, this is the man of the house, thinking of Pastor Rick and this being the house. The man of the house came to me and he says, well, I want you to be the youth pastor. I said, me? What, me? I, I'm working full-time. You want me to be the How am I going to do that? And then he began to explain how I was going to be the youth pastor. And actually, one of the youth leaders is here in the house today as well. He said, I'll put a team around you. I'll give you some help. But I want you to, to lead the youth ministry. And I didn't understand it all at that moment. It was kind of like what God said to Abraham. I just want you to go. I, was like, I want details. No, you just stop when I tell you to stop. How I many of you have God just done that where he didn't give you all the details, but he wanted you to do something? And then there's this other side over here. Some of y'all may like over there, but I'm going to go over here to this other side where God has asked you to do something and then he's told you all the details. Can I give y'all a biblical example? Think of David. Think of David. David's out watching the sheep. Y'all all heard the story. They need to anoint the next king and he's out watching sheep. They get all the other brothers and they line them up and then they say, wait, wait, wait. Where's the other one? Oh, and they go get the youngest one. And then they come in and they, you know, pour it all over. And he becomes king. Wow. After they anoint him king and he gets the details of where he's getting ready to go later, then they send him back out to watch the sheep. Now, how many of y'all could handle that? That you were told that you're going to be the king and now you got to go watch the sheep. I can only imagine. I have played this scenario over in my head over and over again. I have played David over. I can see him out there now. I'm supposed to be the king. Why am I out here still watching the sheep? How are they going to send me back to watch the sheep? It's attitude. How many of you guys, God has spoken to you about something or something has been on your heart and you get attitude? Am I the only one that get attitude with God? And then he tells me all the details because I wanted to know the details. When I was over there, I asked him for details. Over here, he gives me details. And now I say, well, why are you sending me back out to watch the sheep? I can imagine David playing with some rocks and, some sling, and a slingshot going, hmm, send me back out here. I could be out fighting too. And he's mad and he's playing with his slingshot. But sometimes God sends us back into another area because he's preparing us for something. I had no idea that when the Lord spoke to the man of my previous house, my spiritual father, to ask me to be youth pastor, that God had something bigger in store for me. I had no idea. But I just tried to be obedient. And then sometimes God's teaching you something through that experience. Trust me, I learned a lot of lessons being youth pastor. Had no idea that one day that God would take me from being a line agent in Oakland, just a frontline agent, to second in charge of the whole country. Now, I don't tell y'all that to impress you. I tell you that to say, as Pastor Rick just, he invited you. He stood here, he said, we prayed. He said, we're about to do connect groups and we're gonna do some things differently in this house. The man of the house said that. He said, we're gonna do some, and we need leaders. We need people who wanna lead those groups. We want people to wanna do things differently. Let me just let y'all in on a secret. Pastor Rick didn't give me permission to say this, but I'm gonna let y'all in on a secret. If he knew how all of this was going to turn out after the pandemic, he could travel the world and, and, and people would buy it like it was snake oil because everybody, nobody knows. But here's something he just said to y'all. Y'all got it. Y'all, I'm going to demonstrate it to you. He said, let me show you. He said, I see this place full. He said, I see it with people in every seat. So let me give y'all, I'm like a teacher. I'm about to get, y'all gonna have to practice with me now. If you don't see it, before you see it, you'll never see it. Oh, let me do that one more time. Let me do that one. If you don't see it, before you see it, 
you'll never see it. He is seeing this place full. Will you mobilize with him? Will you step up to the plate and serve in one of those connecting? And those of you who are online, you're not out of it either. Because if you think he has the answers for all that he has to do technology-wise and how he's going to serve everybody through the internet, I, he doesn't have all those answers either. Maybe some of you out there are techie and you could do something real different. He, actually, he gave you something. He said there could be groups that meet online too. When you're in the house, there are blessings when you're in the house and you're under the father and mother of the house. I didn't say any of this this morning. But do you believe what God said? He said, just go. Pick up and go. Here's one of the things I got from reading this. Verse 31, if you didn't pick it up. Tara is Abram's father. So he was told to go to Canaan. He leaves. He takes his whole family with him, and he never made it to where he was supposed to go. Now, some of y'all are sitting in these pews and y'all are saying to yourself, yeah, that's good. Pastor Rick said he wants some leaders and people to be a part of connect groups, but I can't speak so well. I don't have any leadership skills. My father and my mother didn't do all the stuff they were supposed to do. We were supposed to go to Canaan and we stopped in Haran. We were supposed to go to uh, Roseville and we stopped over here in Elk Grove and you got all kinds of stuff that you're talking about. Here's what I told my children growing up. Excuses are the tools of the incompetent used by those who seldom succeed. In spiritual realm in the church, we tend to want to make excuses and say to God what we can't do. But guess what? God specializes in people who think they can't do something that he needs you to do. Matter of fact, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I learned this scripture when I was a little kid growing up in the inner city of Los Angeles, Compton, California, and we were doing Bible drills and Easter plays. For I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I memorized that when I was a little boy. Little did I know that that scripture would carry me onto my adulthood, into my marriage, and beyond. Little did I know that it would help me battle when I needed to battle in order to get to my blessings. And there are some scriptures that God has put in some of you that you have to be careful that it is not snatched away from you. But God is not looking for somebody that's perfect. He's looking for someone that's willing to be perfected. He's not looking for somebody who's perfect. He's looking for someone who's willing to be perfected. That he's, you're willing to allow him to work on you to get you to where he wants you to go, to go. Training ground. Do you believe what God has said? Matter of fact, when I was reading this, it said that Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Now, y'all raise your hand if y'all willing to start something new at 75 years old. Say, all right, God, let's start my new adventure. See, there's some folks that's ready to go. But most of us, we don't have the mindset. We don't see it before we see it. So you'll never see it. And then some of you, you see it before you see it. So you're going to see it. Do you believe what God has said? You know what happens when God says some things? Let me, now I ain't going to talk to you. I'm going to talk about me. You know what's happened to me throughout my life when God said some things to me? Fear stepped in. I don't have the skills to be youth pastor. I don't have the skills to serve in this capacity at the church. Hesitation stepped in. Wait a minute. I wanted to go get my doctorate degree. And now you're asking me to stop going, not go to school, and serve the pastor in the church? Yeah, 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 that's what I'm asking you to do, son. That's what I'm asking you to do. Fear. And then anxiety sometimes stepped in. I'm just afraid. I don't, I don't know if I can do what I'm being asked to do. But when you are a part of a house and you have a mother and father in the house, do you know they protect you? It's their safety in the house. There's blessings in the house. And I am so glad that you all are a part of this house. Now I'm going to invite you, not challenge you, I'm going to invite you to take it to the next level and do faith in action. Do you believe what God has said? Next point. Are you moving toward the promise? 
Are you moving toward the promise? In verse 4 and 5 of chapter 12, it says, So Abraham went, and the Lord had told him, and Lot with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, Sarai, his nephew Lot, all their possessions they had accumulated, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out from the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Ah! What a powerful, powerful, powerful verse. Let me just set this up a little bit more. Do you know that Abram and Sarai, they were in Haran, that he was a a sheik. He was rich in the land that his father stopped short of getting to where he was supposed to go. Things were good. How many of you that things are good? And now all of a sudden, you're being asked to move on, to go to a place that you're not familiar with or uncomfortable with. But Abraham obeyed. Abram obeyed. And he was blessed in ways that he never imagined. I can tell you, because I brought a book with me. I wanted to bring a book because telling you something is one thing. Showing you something is a whole different thing. This book right here, back in 2005... My spiritual father, who is in this room right now, told me, it's in the very first page, the very first page. He says, I say this, my father, mentor, and friend advised me to keep a journal on what is going on in my life and at work. Now, I questioned him when he told me to do this. We were eating dinner, and he says, you need to start keeping a journal at work. Now, I had listened to him. He was my spiritual father. He told me to be a youth pastor. I did that, and I got comfortable being a youth pastor. I was good doing that. I stopped applying for jobs because I was secretly applying for jobs. I didn't tell my wife. I was applying for jobs in Los Angeles to go back home. I was applying for jobs in Hawaii. I was applying for jobs all over the place. Guess why? Because I thought I knew God's purpose for my life better than God knew the purpose for my life. And I thought God had already trained me to lead people, but God was still preparing me to lead people. One of the things that he taught me, my spiritual father, he said, pray that your character won't take, your your talent won't take you where your character can't sustain you. Let me say that one more time. Sometimes your talent will take you where your character can't sustain you, and you're not ready for the next level. There was some training, so I began to keep notes. And he said to me, you're, you're now being released from the youth pastor role. I said, what do you mean being released? My family's here. We love it here. Wait, where am I going? He said, just start keeping a journal. He said, like Abraham, like God said, I don't know. Just start keeping a journal and God will tell you. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I need some details like David. No, just, just keep a journal and God will tell you. I will tell you in this book, within a few days, God began to share with me and just in the way God speaks to me, began to show me what my future held in my law enforcement capacity. Now, let me show you something. When I began to serve in my spiritual capacity, God blessed me in my professional capacity. Some of you are sitting here and you are great helpers and could help the man of God in this house. And you have gifts, and you're sitting on your gifts and your talents, and I want to invite you to use those gifts or talents as you mobilize. If you do that, I can tell you that God will bless you. God has blessed me more than I could ever, ever imagine. My family's blessed. My children are blessed. I believe I already see it. See it? Before you see it, that my children's children are blessed. How many of y'all speak that? How many? I see families sitting here with your children. How many of you are saying that my children are blessed and you see your children blessed and your children's children are blessed? Do you believe what God has said? Are you moving toward the promise? And last point. Last point. His word is enough. How many of you know that God said to Abraham in his word, in verse 7, in verse 7, this is what the Lord said to to Abraham in verse 7. It said, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give you this land. So he built an altar. He 
It wasn't just that he heard it. He went to work. There was some action behind it. He built an altar after he heard what the Lord said. To your offspring, I will give you this land. Now, some of you might be saying, well, what's so special about that? His wife, Sarah, was barren. And now all of a sudden, the Lord says to her, your offspring to a person that's barren. Ooh, doesn't God have a sense of humor? Isn't God amazing that he causes you to think about things that you believe can't be done? That is beyond your imagination, beyond what you think is possible. But I told you earlier, God specializes in doing things for people and with people that think that they're not enough. And what he's saying to you is that he's more than enough. That when you begin to not rely on yourself and you begin to rely on the power of God. Let me read you Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Because his word is enough. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Whew. Isn't God's words good? I hope some of y'all caught that. But let me tell you something. My spiritual mother and father, they know my stuff. They know my story. They know that I had to battle for some of my blessings, that you'll still have to fight for your marriage. You'll still have to fight for your children. You'll still have to fight for your family. But that doesn't mean God gives up on his promise. It's coming. His word is enough. And what he starts, whoo, he will finish. If I was to say to any of you outside of this church, outside of this building, that I got a guarantee for you, it's a 100% guarantee. If you give me $100, I turn it into 1000 I guarantee it. I bet I have people lined up around the block. Y'all know how I know? Because we do it with the lottery tickets now, and it ain't a guarantee. And we line up the moment it hits $600 million, And we like, I'm going to play it now, $600 million. And your chances of you winning that are so slim. You might as well get, you, the chances of you getting struck by lightning is more accurate then you win in the lottery. But we line up the play. But the word of God will not fit. There's a guarantee. There's an enemy. But the story said he loses. He loses. He will not win. And yet we, we let him distract us. We let him get us off of his promise. Let me tell you one more. Y'all, that wasn't enough for somebody. That wasn't enough. But his word is enough. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not for you, from yourselves. It's a gift from God. Not by your works so that no man or no one could boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. He prepared it in advance for you to do. I'm a kid from Compton. I didn't have one family member that ever graduated from college. Not one. Not Uncle John. Not Aunt Sarah. Not Aunt Sandra. Not Uncle uh, Johnny. Not one family member that ever graduated from college. And guess what? God put it into my heart that I could be the first one to graduate from college. More than I could ever think or imagine he could do because I am his handiwork and what he starts he will finish for all of those who are out in the internet land and all of those who are in this church that think that you're not enough you're more than enough you know why because he's more than enough and so I want to call you to action as this church begins to mobilize as your pastor not me your pastor said I see it before I see it, and now it's going to happen. I'm going to give you an acronym just like he gave you ESPN for your connect groups. I want to help y'all remember how good God is and how much he'll be enough for you, just so you'll never forget it. The worship team is getting ready to sing Jaira. He's more than enough. He's forever enough. He's always enough. He's more than enough, forever enough, always enough, 
more than enough. Forever, F. Always, A. More, M. He's fam. Just like y'all are in the house, y'all are a part of the fam. Forever enough. He's always enough. He's more than enough.